especially pleased to be here tonight because, as you heard, I am not from these parts. And uh, a few years ago, I put together a CD of stories uh, that detailed my adventures of my arrival in Texas. And I called the CD Guns, Hats, and a Big Gulp, An English Woman in Texas. And I did not know at the time, until my good friend Donna Ingham told me, that there was actually a book by J. Frank Doby called A Texan in England. <laughs> and uh, so when I found out that I was going to be a part of this event this evening, I purchased a copy of the book and then I read it from cover to cover. And seriously, I would love just to read the entire book too, but since it's getting late, I picked a few relevant parts that I think you will enjoy. Um, so I should first tell you that in the fall of 1942, Cambridge University in England instituted a professorship in American history. And Henry Comager of Columbia University was asked to nominate someone to take up this post. And uh, here is what J. Frank Doby had to say about that. It will help if I can see. When he con can you hear me clearly? When he conveyed the invitation, and by the way, I'll have to do this unless you want to hear my ghastly Texas accent. I'm going to be doing this in an English accent. <laughs> when he conveyed the invitation, I explained that I hadn't read the American Constitution since I was a boy and didn't understand it then. I pointed out that my knowledge of history consisted mainly of facts relating to the length of the horns of longhorn steers. The music inherent in coyote howling, the way mother rattlesnakes swallow their young, the duels Jim Bowie fought with his knife, the friendliness of panthers in fighting tigers off helpless Mexican campers, the location of the lost Adams diggings, the speed of the pacing white mustang, the smell of coffee boiled over mesquite wood, the ferocity of devil's horses in attacking hummingbirds, the religious note in ballads about Jesse James and Sam Bass. The shade hunting serenity and grass chewing leisureliness of cowboys. The habits of ghosts in guarding Spanish treasure. How Wrong Wheel Jones got his name. And what, in general, the Southwest was like before, to quote Bigfoot Wallace, Bob Wire played hell with it. Henry Comager answered that he was aware of my ignorance of genuine history but said it wasn't necessary to know any history to teach it to the novices at Cambridge University. <laughs> he said that virtually all the young men were in armed or technical services, and the young women in auxiliary branches, and that whatever I got would be absolutely at my mercy. He said my job would be as elementary as teaching a hound how to suck eggs. He said I could read one of his chapters in American history right before breakfast, and relay it that morning before I forgot it. What Cambridge wanted, he said, was an explainer of America who had had American mud between his toes and grass burrs in his heels, much like we have today. <laughs> he said it wouldn't make any difference whether I took up the tariff question or the chewing gun habit. I told him I didn't know anything about the tariff and never chewed gum, and therefore was only half a typical American. I asked him if it would be all right for me to mention Texas cattle as well as Plymouth Rock chickens. He said to go ahead with the Rio Grande and to throw in the horned frog if I wanted to. <laughs> Meantime, I had a letter from my fellow Texan, Walter Webb at Oxford, saying to make my own definition of history and come on over. The war had been my war since it began in 1939. On a September day, four years later, after four years after it began, I left Austin, Texas, feeling that even though I was too old to fight, it was something to be going in the direction of fighting men. I had long had the conviction, stronger now than ever, that despite all good neighbor policies, and they are good policies, the one chemical blend that America can make with other nations is with the English-speaking ones, and that the decencies and amenities of civilization in general of our own civilization in particular, depend on that blend. Perhaps, I thought, I could add my might 
to making the English-speaking nations understand each other better. To understand is to forgive. And after he arrived, he got settled, he got to know a few people. And this is my favorite little snippet about his uh, interaction with an Englishman he came to know. On the afternoon of the longest day of the year, I sit by a coal fire, smoking a pipe, and not grumbling at the weather. There are heavy clouds and the wind is out of the north as it has been most of the days for two weeks, making our invasion operations more difficult and making the achievements of the operators more admirable. I have just had a visit from a fine old English gentleman, a doctor of medicine past 80. After he had got his legs comfortably positioned and filled his pipe, he recalled how Emerson and Carlyle sat all one evening before a fire, saying nothing and saying nothing, and how when at last Emerson rose to go, he broke the silence by remarking, this has been one of the most congenial evenings within my memory. My sprightly old friend and I sat by the fire and talked. He said, as I have heard scores, perhaps hundreds of other people in this country say with deep conviction, that mutual understanding between America and the British nations is to be des desired almost as much as victory over the enemy. I sit here by the fire in a comfort that seems immoral and shameful when I think of our men. And by our men, I mean the British as well as the American, dying and fighting on day and night without sleep or ready food. The pilotless bombs destroying London homes do nothing to the spirits of the people but strengthen them. I have come to the conclusion that an Englishman will hardly shed tears over a personal sorrow, will not feel sorry for himself, but when it comes to the land he has planted in for so many centuries and loves for its spiritual as well as material qualities, it is quite different. And he goes on to say, Dr. Pritchard looks 50-ish. I met him in the dark days of last November. I had rushed out of a lighted room about eight o'clock one night. Without pausing to accustom my eyes to the blackout, I rammed myself into a cornice that knocked the breath out of me. About three days later, I decided I'd either broken a rib or mashed one of my lungs. Slight of body, bright of eye and face, but quiet of voice, Dr. Pritchard brought, me in, brought into my room more sunshine than any English winter could afford. He said a rib was only bruised and take me up. I felt new made and wore that tape until I came near having to call him to do some skin grafting. Then, three or four weeks later, I took to moping about with what was probably influenza, result of that science-defying amalgamation of dampness, chilliness, and stone walls of antiquity. Dr. Pritchard came again and brought sunshine. He paid several calls, though he and all other doctors were rushed to exhaustion in those days. Along after New Year's, I asked my Cambridge mentor if the doctor would not send a bill. Oh, he'll send it eventually, my mentor said. I had learned that bills are often as slow in arriving over here as they are from that old southern gentleman-styled hotel, the Driscoll, in Austin. May its shadow and that of its curtly host never grow less. After waiting three months, I decided to call on Dr. Pritchard. I just wanted to see him anyhow. In front of a fire in a room with two bright pictures and a graceful ship model in it, he began telling me about two Texans, oilmen, he knew in Persia. One of them was very quiet, never said anything, and had the reputation of being a dangerous man. The other talked a lot and talked loud and one day missed 12 six-shooter shots at a beer bottle. It took me several minutes to get to my bill. Oh, I never keep books, Dr. Pritchard laughed. Then he began telling me about the prisoner of war who made the beautiful sailing slip. I got back to the bill again. Oh, he said, I wouldn't think of charging an American. You're all over here, you know. There's too much charging going on. We hear about it, and it's a bloody shame. As a matter of fact, there is less overcharging American soldiers in England than there is in American cities frequented by them. I've never charged an American, he said, and I won't. And I have to get even with you somehow, I said. No, it is not a matter of getting even with me. The account 
has been balanced. So I went to a bookstore, and with instructions for proper delivery, I bought a copy of a certain book. On the fly leaf it of it, on the fly leaf of it, I wrote, Brightness falls from the air where Dr. Pritchard walks. This is a salute to his gallantry and generosity from an American whose life he has brightened. But that American does not imagine that 12 shillings and sixpence worth of book has evened up the doctor's bill. Thank you. <laughs>